this is uh, something really different uh, than some of the other presentations. Um, and uh, this might prove a benefit for you at this late time of the afternoon, because now you can sit back and be inspired by uh, my presentation that deals with a different part of the workflow, perhaps, of researching all history archives. Because uh, what I'm going to talk about is the process of research, uh, of identifying and conducting all histories, and how to f uh, analyze them afterwards. And it's about it's to deal with the uh, hidden children in Denmark during the Holocaust. And I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity to present not only some methodological reflections on all history as sources and as historical research, but also about an important but less known aspect of Holocaust history. I'll briefly, briefly present in my presentation an all history project that uncovered a repressed aspect of a beloved story of the rescue of the Danish Jews during the Holocaust. However, it did not take me long to realize that the project was much more than that. A silence that had prevailed for six de decades was broken, and with one stroke, a group of people was given a new identity and a new narrative about their lives. To a great extent, it was a narrative that I, as a historian, had facilitated, and it forced me to, uh, to head on to consider a range of methodological and ethical aspects of all history. Surprisingly, it all started at an archi archive. Some years ago, a reorganization of the city archive of Copenhagen uncovered three boxes of materials that were seemingly misplaced among the massive archive of the Social Security Office. The boxes contained materials from an agency with the unsuspicious name of the Social Service, which had originally been set up in the spring of 1943 with the intention of providing room and board for people whose homes were destroyed or had been abandoned temporarily because of incidents of war. That means primarily air raids. Moreover, this agency carried out catastrophic planning for mass evacuations, water, and food supplies. However, on October 2nd, 1943, the local authorities of Copenhagen City received an unusual request from the Ministry of Welfare. The ministry requested that the city safeguarded the belongings and properties of the Jews who had fled their homes after the German raid that night, the night before on October 1st. From 1943 and towards the end of the war, the social service state dealt with almost 2,000 inquiries about empty flats or suspicious circumstances around the city. When the social service received an inquiry, they visited the residents, checked the conditions, and made a complete inventory of the household effects. If it was possible to retain the flat, the social service paid the rent until Denmark was liberated in 1945. Alternatively, all personal property and furniture were put in storage. Contracts with trustees for property and businesses were established with neighbors, relatives, and employees, and theft and larceny were circumvented. In 1944, the employees destroyed most of the archive because they feared confiscation by the German security police. Yet three boxes survived, only then to disappear for six dec decades. The work of the social service was extraordinary. During the German occupation, a Danish public agency managed to protect the abandoned property of the Jews. The rationale behind the work of the social service was that the Jews should have homes to return to. No less remarkable was the fact that their work was carried out not out according to agreement with the German authorities, allowing protections of homes and properties of deported Jews. That the Danes expanded this task to cover all Jews resident in Denmark demanded discretion and security measures. This was reflected in the language of the documents that could be laconic and, and, and cryptic. In my eyes, some of the comments in these documents was, was still almost printed in bold letters. Let me give you some examples. In November 1943, the social service conducted an investigation into an abandoned apartment and interviewed the resident caretaker. According to the report, the caretaker stated, and I quote, that man and wife are now in Sweden while an unbaptized child lies at a Copenhagen ho hospital. In another case, the social service was tidying up an apartment when a woman who claimed to be the sister-in-law of the residents turned up and explained, I quote, that the couple had left on the 9th of October 1943, leaving two children with relatives, another child with herself, and the youngest child at a children's home. In yet another case, the caretaker's wife informed that 
All children were placed in children's home through the Child Protection Agency when the parents left. All in all, the material from the social service revealed nine cases of children who were left behind when their parents fled the Nazi persecution and went in exile in Sweden. A further inquiry into the archives of the Child Protection Agency revealed that at least 20 Jewish children were placed in children's homes or otherwise cared for by the Child Protection Agency. Thus, the written official sources could document that at least 27 children were hidden in Denmark. Each one of these children deserved to have their case investigated and documented. But I had to ask myself if the number 27 was so small that it was hardly a general phenomenon, or on the contrary so large that it called for further investigations. In such situations, sheer numbers are not important. Instead, you have to look for patterns in the materials. And most of all, patterns again ex expected correlations. For example, children from social classes that were usually not represented in the official sources, such as the Child Protection Agency. Secondly, you have to assess the limits of the written sources. In my case, it was official, however fragmented sources, subject to discretion and security measures, as I mentioned. And it enha enhanced the possibility that some cases were never recorded. Thirdly, you have to consider the reason why the sources were silent. Repression is both a psychological individual phenomenon and a social process between people. Silence is a social phenomenon or a social construction where a group of people deems it improper to speak about a certain subject. Confronted with social taboos or situations that calls for thoughtfulness or tact, humans react with silence. The reasons for such conspiracies of silence are often, often trauma and most often fear and shame. Silence is obviously a tricky field of research. It is difficult to document and verify. The, when, when silence is identified, it is no longer silent. Furthermore, it is difficult to di 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 differentiate between ignorance and silence, that is, the active act of avoiding to speak. I was in a situation where I had derived the written sources of all it pot its potential, but I was convinced that there were more children out there because of the plausible reasons for repressing their stories. Because the psychological practices towards traumatized children were fundamentally different at that time, and silence was the recommended treatment. As one of the interviews we collect, when I was little, children did not have traumas. They were just naughty. And because the parents were ashamed by their decision to leave the children behind. Luckily, I was in a situation where I had the resources to conduct all histories uh, which were recorded and archived at the Danish Jewish Museum in Copenhagen. But first, I had to establish contact with the children. It posed a problem. The phenomenon had no name in Danish language. It is, however, far from unknown in a European context. Thousands of Jewish children survived the Holocaust because they were physically hidden in cellars, bunkers, sewers, attics, or went into visible hiding, that is, joining a family, convent, or an orphanage, under a false identity. In an international context, these children are referred to as hidden children. A distinction is often drawn in international literature between passive and active hiding. Passive hiding covers children hidden by others, whereas active hiding designates children who themselves hid or lived illegally. What is more, a child can be in invisible hiding and invisible hiding. The Danish children were, as far as I knew, all in passive visible hiding as the children took part in the daily life of the families or at the children's home and were, cared, were taken care for or even loved by their foster parents. Danish language distinguish exactly between the meanings of, a hi of these two meanings of hide, that is between caretaking or safekeeping and between physical hiding. I chose the meaning of caretaking. But translation of the term into Danish meant constructing a narrative. A narrative of the fate of these children even before I had met these children. The narrative contained a confirming story of foster parents who took on the, heavenly, the heavy responsibility without knowing how long they had to care for the child or what the consequences or punishments it might entail. In the summer of 2009, I persuaded the national newspaper Politiken to publish an interview with this young lady. 
Her personal history and the courage she showed by making it public made the telephones ring repeatedly at the Danish Jewish Museum. The children themselves, relatives, friends and neighbors stormed the telephone lines and in just a few days the list of hidden children in Denmark grew to well over 100 named children. This article in the newspaper was not only a new si sensation but a dramatic moment for the children themselves. Each one of them had thought that they were the only child that had been left behind. With one stroke they got a new identity and a life story with a new meaning. In the following months, the total number of children grew to more than 150. They represent at least 10% of all the children who were victims of Nazi persecution in Denmark. For the youngest children, the percentage, percentage is even higher. More than 20% of these children under the, under the age of five years stayed in Denmark. I conducted more than 20 life stories, uh, interviews, only audio, with these hidden children as well as numerous conversations, correspondences, and meetings. These oral histories can be used both as sources to the past events and circumstances, and as sources to the context and situation in which they were created. All history must be subjected to the critical evaluation as to the credibility and testimonial value, just as traditional written sources. So far, so good. However, the situation in which the whole, the, all histories are created are the greatest source of error, just as it is the raison d'etre of the method. All history is not just a method to create sources, it creates meaning. This is strong evidence of the fact that the historian actually creates history. This is what happens already when you invite someone for an interview and thus establishes the authority of that same person. It is what happened when you, act, you acknowledge that the interviewer is not a neutral, impersonal observer. On the contrary, the interviewee adapts his or, his answer, his or hers answers according to the interviewer's gender, age, ethnicity and status, depending on what she or he thinks the interviewer would like to hear. And thirdly, the interview process itself affects the memory of the interviewee even long time after the interview. Memory is an active process of that constructs meaning. Memory is an attempt to create meaning and coherence in our lives. We construct our identity by telling stories about our lives. It is an interaction where memory and narratives construct identity just as our identity affects our memory. As a historian and expert in all history with veterans of the Great War puts it, who we think we are now and what we want to become affects what we think we have been. This was evident in the process of interviewing the hidden children. The term itself contained a narrative even before the interview began. But the children were transformed in the process and adapted this new identity and a new narrative about their lives to be further expanded and personalized. The confirmative narrative about a fate as a hidden child in Denmark probably facilitated that so many came forward with their story. None of these children were unaffected by the fact that they had been left behind and often left to strangers when their family fled to Sweden. They were excluded from the family's history just as their parents repressed the situation of the child and persuaded, <coughs> persuaded the children to do the same. For the youngest children in particular, liberation in May 1945 meant a painful departure from foster parents and a reunion with, with, with biological parents they no longer recognized. The narrative that I now found in my research not only focused on the comfort in, comforting relation with the foster parents, but stressed the necessity and distress of their parents' choice to leave them behind. In the construction of their personal memory narrative, Moon was often made for re reconciliation and comprehension. And most of the interviewees received the narrative and the new shared identity with gratitude. They now found an acknowledgement of their childhood difficulties, a comprehension of the emotional challenges the separation posed for them as well as for their parents, and a community with other hidden children. Since I undertook the interviews with the hidden children, they have for formed their own organization and have been acknowledged as entitled to restitution from the Claims Conference, also known as the Conference of, material, of Jewish Material Claims Against Germany. And thereby, they are acknowledged as Holocaust survivors. They also regained new interest in family history and eagerly contributed 
to, um, to identify written sources. One example, oh, one example of this uh, is a man that had no memory of his foster parents and had no other items to remind him of his foster parents than their photo album with a series of photographs of himself as a baby in the arms of a man or woman whose faces were unknown to him. He threw himself into a seamless inquiry and he succeeded in finding out the names of the man or the woman in the photographs. The foster parents who had cared for him for almost two years when he was taken out of an incursibator at the maternity ward at the local hospital. They were the family's neighbors. Reconstruction of the situation in, Octo in the October days of 1943, when their parents had to give them up, and ad identification of their foster parents can be a very important element in the process of recognition of hidden children. A woman had suffered all her life of the disturbances of their separation. She and her sister were both hidden in Denmark when their parents fled, as her older si but her older sister were later transported eagerly, illegally to Sweden because it was still considered too dangerous to bring along the little sister. So she stayed with her grandfather and his housekeeper until liberation. The woman, who was then only eight months old, never felt she re-entered the family when father, mother and her big sister returned from Sweden. She didn't share the family experience of exile in Sweden and no one ever asked her about her life in Denmark. The situation was often particularly difficult for children whose older siblings accompanied, it, accompanied their parents to Sweden. In such circumstances, these children retained private explanations of why they were left behind. That mother preferred the older siblings, that the new stepmother uh, didn't want the children to come along, or that the little brother was so difficult. This form of rationalizing or mistaken convictions becomes reality for the child and influences the concept of self, the process of growing up, and the relationship to the other members of the family. In many instances, um, the relationship to siblings who went to Sweden was spoiled forever. The woman that I mentioned had not talked to her sister for years and had lost all contact. The first thing she did after the interview was to call her. A woman was separated from her father in, a fishing, in the fishing hamlet of Gidelai, north of Copenhagen, as she and her mother were hidden in the fisherman's family home, while her father were hidden at the attic of Gidelai church. Later that night, the church was raided by the Germans, and her father was deported to concentration camp. Her mother was devastated by the separation. She was alone with a small child without any money. A compassionate woman offered her to take care of the child. Her mother reasoned that the most important thing was the survival of the child. So she paced, placed her three-year-old daughter with a local family and fled to Sweden. In Sweden, she was torn by guilt and shame and felt betrayed by her husband, who had abandoned her. The girl's father, meanwhile, in the Theresienstadt ghetto, knew nothing of the fate of his child. He too felt betrayed. Not knowing the difficulties of sending letters and parcels to the camp, he measured the love of his wife by the limited amount of letters he received. He felt forgotten. The woman had never told anybody about the difficult time she went through when her family were united after the war, and they were slowly torn apart by guilt, shame, and frustration. Her story and the letters and photographs she retrieved and showed me stressed how much they had all loved her. During her youth, though, she had cut off all relations with her foster parents as well as to her biological parents. Her encounter with this confirming narrative in the interview situation did not facilitate reconciliation. On the contrary, it generated guilt and anger. And I, as the interviewer and recreator of the narrative, came in the line of fire. It even came to threats of a lawsuit. Fortunately, I then got not only the backing of an institution, the Danish Jewish Museum, but legal grounds in the Danish law on museums that specifies procedure for donations. The donations that donations cannot be conditional and never be, re be dis discarded. Her story is the exception that proves the, the exceptions, the exception that proves the rule. It testified to an emotional process of recognition and to the inevitable responsibility you have to take on as an interviewer. It may seem cynical, but in, uh, in an oral history project, our first priority must be the critical interpretation. The feelings of the interviewee must come in second. If reverse, it is no longer an historical, but a therapeutic project. 
one in which the historians have no documented abilities. That we have to consider scientific standards first does not dissolve the ethical dilemma we experience as fellow human beings. It is somewhat a consolation that neither interviewee nor interviewer is left empty-handed. The life story of the interviewee has been granted a significance <coughs> that recognizes the, the unique status of the personal story and its historical value. The unique benefits of all history are the memory and identity processes to which the interview is often our only source. When we think we have identified such a relic of memory, we have to remember <coughs> that we have created ourselves the context of the interview, and often even the narrative, the norms, and the templates that the story will unfold. Furthermore, we have to identify the narrative techniques embedded in our culture and in collective memory, as it is manifested in the interview. The precondition of identifying these narratives are our knowledge of their existence, and those memory narratives that are constructed in the interview itself is just as natural objects of our investigation as the narrative constructed by culture and history. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>